Welcome everyone to this edition of the Verifiability Talk. It's my honor to introduce um, our speaker today, Philippa Gardner. Uh, Philippa is a professor at the Department of Computing at Imperial College, and she holds um, a UKRI chair for UK research and innovation there. Uh, she has been at all the good places uh, like uh, Edinburgh, Cambridge. Uh, she has held the Microsoft uh, research chair and has done um, lots of great work about uh, uh, verification. Um, her new project, which is very um, uh, inspiring and, and promising, is about a new language for symbolic analysis of real world uh, programming languages like, like C and Java. And uh, I think she will be talking about that today, judging from the title. Philippa, thank you very much for having uh, accepted our invitation. This meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube. So if you don't want your name to appear in the recording and on YouTube, you could join us uh, using a guest account. And without further ado, I give the floor to our speaker today, Philippa. Thanks again, Philippa, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much and absolutely, I was so delighted to be asked. It's uh, lovely with, and in particular we've talked lots at meetings, but actually to uh, uh, to be uh, asked to give a talk. Thank you, that was great. And I've um, changed the, my title ever so slightly um, just because I've gone a bit wider with what I'm saying rather than um, just focusing on um, my analysis tools, hence the wider name. And in particular, I'm going to talk about verified trustworthy software specification. It's actually the um, title of my uh, fellowship proposal when I got my fellowship. And the, but this is just a, um, a bit of it. And I'm sort of halfway through. So this is my um, current group. And I'm not going to be cautious about who's doing what where. Um, basically, I'll do some of that as we go along, but uh, it's a bit approximate and they are fabulous. Uh, we've got some co-authors here. Um, Jose is now at um, Lisbon. He was at Imperial. Julian's just left and gone to industry. And Carolina is an awesome undergraduate intern from um, Germany who's been fabulous. So here's just one approach for thinking about um, verified specification. And I'm going to sort of nod at some others as we go along the way, but this is me focusing on the sort of things that I do. And in particular, we have um, the target language, the language we want to do analysis um, on. And at this point, we're giving program specifications. So in particular, think of this. Here you are, a code developer, at the moment quite specialist, in future maybe less specialist if we do a good job. Um, and there the idea is to put annotations in the code so that, uh, 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 which are um, from logic, but in a simplified form. And then there is um, a compiler and we compile to an intermediate representation where actually this is where the analysis is done and this bit is automatic. So from the point of the code developer, you're sitting here pressing a button, hopefully getting understandable stuff back. In reality, the stuff is not understandable at the moment. Eventually, we hope it will be. Number four MSC project, we'll see what happens. And just to lock this into the sort of work that people are doing. So a lot of people have done work on automatic and mainly automatic symbolic testing. And they will do that by compiling to some intermediate representation. And we do do this work, but we are not in this game for the purpose of this talk. For the purpose of this talk, we are doing um, verification. And for that, there were very few um, people working on it. The AWS crowd are um, thinking about this quite hard now, but they, I think, are outliers in this. 
And in particular, they're doing a lot of work on CB CBMC, bounded model checking for, uh, for C, that was um, sort of one of the uh, key people getting it into practice was Daniel Kronig. But also they're pushing from um, uh, the work on symbolic testing, which is where they've really hit to, is it possible to um, do a bounded verification? And they're focusing on it, uh, on it a lot. There's the famous C guys, and they're working in the French Atomic Authority, uh, uh, working with them. And they are very much doing whole logic based on uh, first order logic. I've done a, um, a really good job pushing that um, traditional whole logic world to practice. And then there's, uh, the, uh, the, the, this is a representative example, that's all. And then there are these guys, including uh, myself, that are very much focusing in this new world of separation logic rather than um, first order logic. If you don't know much about separation logic, I will be saying a little bit, but I'm not going to go into too much detail of this. So I will try to show you where it's really hitting uh, and the point of it at um, some point. So Verifast and Viper are done by, uh, are led by Bart and um, Peter Muller, um, Bart Jacobs. And um, we couldn't find a photo of the gang of people working on frequency, probably because they're doing the industry thing. So we have a target language, and that target language could be many things. It could be C, JavaScript, Python, Rust, WebAssembly. And they are defined in different ways. So we can either have the English code and pseudocode, or we can have a reference implementation, as illustrated by these examples, or we can have formal specification with Robin Milner on um, ML being um, the founder of that uh, line of work. And what I'd like to do for the beginning of this talk is um, do a little excursion outwards to some work we've been doing on WebAssembly. So I'm going to spend most of my talking um, time talking about this um, work, but I'm just going to show you a little bit about what's going on here and why actually, because I'm rather proud of this and I just wanted to tell you, <laughs> but no, no more of a reason. So I've spent a long time on this work with um, in Rio people, um, I did uh, um, JavaScript mechanized specification in the Koch theorem prover. And I've always been going, right, what does it mean to get to the standard? What's it mean to get um, to the standards body? And we spent a long time here talking a lot with um, Etmascript. And um, it was just too hard because here we are in JavaScript where we stopped was Etmascript 5 strict. That was already rather big for an academic project. They moved to Etmascript 6, suddenly it's double the size. What do we do? But um, with WebAssembly, things are much more um, tangible because the language is so small. And really, this is an exciting place because this is where we have formal standard, formal in the programming language, formal method sense. And this is the only way at the moment that um, anything will get through the standards body, that is using formal methods. So it's come from the Robin Milner tradition, but he was doing it by hand, and then people evolved that to mechanization by many people, in, and um, this is where we are now. So with WebAssembly, a key person is Anders Rosberg. There are um, basically four major browsers represented by the work on WebAssembly, given by the formal draft specification at PRDI in um, 2017. But this is not the whole story. And this guy here is Conrad Watt. And he lucked out and did amazing thing. He was actually, he came from, he's now in Cambridge, but he came from Imperial and he uh, came, did a lot of projects with me and knew the JS cert work very well. 
went to Anders Rosberg uh, in um, Munich in Google and was doing an internship there, heard about WebAssembly and ended up in this world. So he's done um, an ISPEL mechanized specification using the uh, methodology introduced by JS Cert. And in particular, he lucked out because he found mistakes in the specification and in the statement of the theorem that got corrected before this PLDI publication. So um, basically, the uh, um, the emphasis on WASM and WebAssembly as this um, formally defined um, language, it works in part because Comrade caught some problems. Well done, him is great. Um, we've got WebAssembly 1.0, and uh, that's that's now um, static and they got a software award for it. And um, by a random sequence of events, uh, we've ended up joining together. So I'm now working with Conrad. There's, um, me, uh, there's a gang in, my, uh, in Imperial, a gang in um, Cambridge um, with um, Jean Pichon now move, moved to Aarhus. And basically we're doing two mechanized specifications, one in Isabel and one in Cock. So the sorts of things that we've done, we've done um, a mechanized inductive definition, a reference interpreter. It's correct with respect to the um, uh, inductive definition extracted to OCaml. We get the sort of results that we would expect, such as type soundness, and there's some extensions. Now, um, the difference between what happened in JavaScript, we could do um, the inductive def, we could do the first two bits. We couldn't go anywhere near the proofs because we broke um, the Cock theorem proof. The memory was just not big enough. It was too much. So here actually is the first time that we've got these um, uh, results done for an industry standard and in real world. We are now, um, uh, instead of this um, two kept separate, we're now going from um, proof here to um, the reference interpreter. We can get it out of the proof. And we thank um, Phil Wadler for um, uh, pointing us in that direction. We've also got, we were going a slightly different way because we have also, um, uh, Conrad is getting um, a fast reference interpreter with his um, Isabel um, uh, mechanization. And, but what do I mean fast? provably correct, fast enough to be used in industry. That's his aim. And then we're also working with Iris guys on, and in particular Aarhus, on doing program logics for Watson. And the main issue and the main task is, what does it mean to show so much worth that actually standards will use formal methods and uh, mechanization in future? We actually have shown the worth already in the sense that we've um, uh, changed right the basic um, specification and um, theorem. But what's it mean to do more? And we do have a bottleneck here because how do we provide a mechanization that's going to keep up with what's happening with the WASM standard? And this is the place where we don't understand. But um, already we've got, um, you know, we know given the ecosystem of our world that actually um, this is really hard. Quite a lot of the time, there are people in companies and in academia who are doing the standards body work for free um, because they uh, um, are so passionate about what they're doing. And then on top of that, what's it mean for the academics to, um, to show the next steps and the next, um, uh, and the worth of the mechanized specification? Extremely hard, and I don't know where we will go with this. In particular, Martin's um, now in Inria Grenoble doing other stuff. Um, Jean's moved to Aarhus and is really on other stuff. Uh, my student Rao is currently working and Conrad is currently working. But at some point, Conrad's going to want to go off and do something else. He can't spend his academic career doing this. So how do we do it? I don't know. That's where it's at. 
But back to now my um, main story. So in my tool, we can do um, C, and in particular, something called C Lite, which is the language of the concert um, compiler. And we're now uh, very much focusing on C and Rust in particular. I don't have much to say about the compilation. Um, we use the um, Compsat C for, um, for uh, our C stuff, and that's Savia. KML is another mechanized specification from um, uh, ML to um, right down to hardware, actually. And we've got a postdoc coming from um, Magnus, Mike, uh, Magnus Myrene um, in, uh, in my group. Um, we've also done work on uh, JavaScript compilation, and in particular at the time, ours was very um, substantial and doing a real um, difference in uh, uh, a real um, sort of concentration on methodology. We want to preserve the memory model. We have um, we want to preserve the semantics. We want um, the specification to be at the target language, so the annotations have to come down to the intermediate language representation. We're line by line close to the standard. Things are well tested. That's where we were a few years ago. And then um, so Kyung um, uh, Rue came along. Um, she has got um, a compiler, a JavaScript compiler, but she's done it um, going from uh, natural language processing, going from the pseudocode contract and actually just pulling a, a, a pseudocode standard and pulling out from that the um, uh, the um, real um, definition of uh, JavaScript that she can then um, use how she wishes. So here, sort of absolutely, I think for the first time, we've got the whole standard, even though it's absolutely huge and monstrous thing. So this is, this is sort of another way that the um, uh, people are coping with the standard. Um, but what I actually, I don't want to concentrate on the compiler. Um, what I want to concentrate on is this bit and my tool, Gillian, um, which has been developed by Petter, Jose, uh, Sasha as the main people. So we have a small little intermediate go-to language called Jill. And the point about this is actually we are making no, um, uh, we're absolutely doing very little going from the target language to here. We all know that control flow can be done in a go-to language. So here we're just doing um, a, a semantic preserving compiler, nothing to do with performance, to a place where we're ignoring control flow and using the go-to language. So that was the reason for the choice. Some people stay up here and work with the particular target languages they want to work with and analyze there. But, but we're working here going, we don't care what the um, language is. We care very much what the basic commands are that interact with the memory model. And this is where um, we are focusing our attention. We are, um, we are hooking to a first order solver. It happens to be the uh, Z3. We don't have much to say about that, except for it takes an awful long time to do it. I think that's the best way to <laughs> say that, but there are more expert people than we are. We have modular analysis in the sense that we start off with an execution engine at the core, build up verification, and for those of you who know, build up a technique called bioabduction. All of this is underpinned by um, the world of separation logic that's come um, from Pete O'Hearn and John Reynolds. And then absolutely for us quite pivotable is that we are parametric on the concrete and the symbolic memory model of the target language. And in particular, just as we've got execution verification by abduction, we need to get the core memory actions, how the memory is getting updated. 
we need to extend core predicates for doing the verification and by abduction means fixes from errors, which I'm not going to go into today. So I am going to concentrate on verification. So we start off with core predicates and they're the fundamental um, units of the target language. This can get quite uh, complex, but from the point of view of this um, talk, it's going to be extremely uh, simple. So memory is built up of these um, little units. And um, the uh, precise um, thing that we do is we have consumers where we frame off the core um, predicate resource. And this, um, we have something like a core predicate could describe a little cell in memory, and a consumer is saying, take that cell out of memory. And then we have producers that say, put that cell back in memory, but maybe you've changed the value of the cell. So it's the actual bit of the update and the bit in the middle, um, this bit here, this bit is the frame that's doing nothing, just waiting for the update to happen. And we put it back once that update is done. So this is absolutely the core simplest um, thing that we have. So they have this form and you've got some notion of predicate. Um, you needn't think of this like logical predicates because actually it's embedded right in the heart of the execution engine. But really they're like um, little predicates in logic. And um, but we have in parameters and out parameters. That's the difference. And the idea is if we know the in parameters, then we know all of the parameters. So, for example, if we have a cell, if we know the address of the cell, we then know the value of the cell. Yeah. If we are in a tree, if we know the pathway to the place we want to get to, then we know the um, information at the place we want to get to. So it's the same thing regardless of which sort of memory model we have. And what it does, it allows us to implement a parametric unification algorithm that allows us to work with these um, consumers and um, producers attached to these core predicates sort of for free. And then one does an instantiation for the particular language we're um, interested in working with. So just as a tiny example, if you have a block offset um, cell assertion, then the in parameters are given by the block identifier and the offset, and the out uh, parameter is the um, value. We will get a little bit more complicated in a minute. And on top of these core predicates, we can then um, build other things. So for example, in uh, how I'm thinking of it uh, for this talk, inside user-defined predicates, one might have arrays. The, um, this, we can work with arrays up to a certain point in this way. Arrays are known to be complicated, and at some point we have to think about them as core predicates. And at that point, things get really quite hard. Um, we have um, what we're calling pure assertions that are just the first order assertions, think um, uh, uh, path conditions in a symbolic engine. And we have separating conjunction rather than first order logic conjunction. And what that does is allowing us to be compositional, and I'll show you what I mean by this in a minute. And we have, um, with this, we have a parametric definition of satisfiability in terms of consumers and producers. And in particular, given the core pred predicates, such as the cell, what does it mean that the memory satisfies that cell? It's given in terms of the consumers and the producers. So then absolutely, the name of the game is, what does it mean to do function specifications? And in particular, what does it mean to be compositional with respect to functions? And um, the world of separation logic has led to a lot of ideas that are now embedded inside 
any companies, but the first company was um, Facebook, now Meta, where they do, um, they have this tool called Infer that Pete O'Hearn is doing. And absolutely, the whole issue was what does it mean to be compositional in this um, industrial code base where you've got millions of lines of code and you're working with your tiny function that might call other functions. So the point is, with this sort of work, um, work I'm telling you about now, we can act. We are absolutely compositional. So in particular, we have the current state, and we have this precondition p. And then what um, happens is that by the consumers that get lifted from not just the core predicates, but also to arbitrary assertions, we can consume the precondition with some substitution um, theta by matching this precondition to whatever um, memory, symbolic memory we have. We can consume it leaving the frame, and then we can produce the result given by um, this post condition with the appropriate substitution. And this is pro possible given the underlying um, uh, foundational work on separation logic. And with this um, work, we're able to produce correctness results. And in particular, these are parametric correctness results that basically things are correct under the assumption of little lemmas that you have to prove about how for a particular target language and a particular memory, what does it mean for the um, actions and the core predicates to work well with respect to that memory? So this, the first one is symbolic execution makes sense with respect to, to concrete execution. That's saying at the level of these simple actions such as read, write, update, we can um, show that the symbolic execution is doing the right thing with respect to the um, concrete execution. From the point of view of the verification, it's saying that the producers and consumers are working well with respect to frame on these core predicates. And then I won't tell you about by abduction today, you can end up with errors that can be automatically fixed. And this is saying that that is done well. So I'm going to give you, um, for Gillian instantiation, I'm just going to talk about C. And I'm going to tell you um, about a very simplified uh, C model to get, to get the ideas across. So in particular, um, so in JavaScript, our JavaScript work, we've got the memory um, absolutely on the nose. We haven't made any simplifications. Why? Because although um, JavaScript is complex, it's actually complex from the point of view of control flow. It's not complex from the point of view of um, the uh, basic actions and the core predicates. It's, it has lots of abstractions, sure, and we have a lot of work to do, but absolutely at the um, starting point, it is not um, difficult. C, we know the memory model is um, difficult, and we've had lots of help from the past from um, the concert guys, which is um, Xavier uh, and, yeah, that, yes, I'm thinking Blase. Um, and um, we have also had help from Krebers. Sandrine, that's the woman's name. Um, and there, we are, we are basically working in that world. So in fact, we're as, we're as complex as they are complex. But for here, I'm going to say it in a much um, simpler, simpler way just to um, help the um, exposition. So we have um, a block offset memory model. So here's the um, block identifier starting from zero. It goes to some block bound and the rest um, Think of it as not there, it gives um, buffer overruns. We're in a compositional world, and what that means from the, is that we might have part of the block that is missing. So from the concrete world, 
if we're in whole memory, this would not be missing. We would know absolutely everything about the C memory, and we could think of this as just a list. From the point of view of um, compositional reasoning, we need to um, think about this as a bound that may or may not be there and as a list with holes. So we can formulate that. We do it in a flat way. We go all the way up to tree-like structures of Krebers for those of you who know about it. And here an address in this case is given that block identifier and that offset, we have um, the value. We also have um, another um, uh, possibility, which is that a block can be freed. So given that a block can be freed after it, when it's freed, when it gets accessed again, as long as there's no reallocation that says, no, nope, not allowed, you can't use after you've freed it. So that's th the intuition of what we're doing. And in the C standard, these pink bits are given by undefined behavior. But in our world, they are given by um, errors that we are um, delivering back to the code developer saying, are you sure you want to do that in your code? So actually, our core predicates are more complicated than I said, but not by much in this simple case. So we have the block cell, but we, or, which may or may not be there. It might be missing. We have um, block bound looking like this. And what that says is that at this location, we have that bound and that may or may not be there. We also have the freed block um, saying that it's not there, using the empty symbol to say that. Now, what's going on? In, um, if we have a function and all that function is doing is updating this um, a value with uh, address L um, O, uh, and all it's doing is doing the update of that partic one particular cell, then that function specification does not need to know about the bound. In fact, it can't know about the bound because you don't know what the bound is. It also doesn't know about the rest of the block. It doesn't know anything. It only knows that given that tiny cell, we can update it. So this is why in the compositional world, we have to be very, uh, we're working with memory model with lots and lots of holes that gets filled in and turns into the whole memory model at some point. We also have this block bound information and we write it in this way. This is actually intuitively describing infinite information because what it's saying is from the bound upwards, we've got nothing there. So we can actually, for those who know separation logic, this is an it, uh, infinite if to a star of these not there things. But we can't do that. In, we don't want to do that infinite um, thing. So instead, we go to the uh, this way of doing it. And this is enough information to get us what we need. And then we have basic actions. So for the basic action, um, like a call cell uh, that um, uh, is accessing the address given by L and O. Well, this is a, so excuse me, this is this is a consumer. So given the cell, we have consumers and producers. This is the um, uh, consumer that takes L and O and says, here it is. And here's the um, value V. But it may not be there. And in particular, if we have um, L in memory, if it's not there, then this um, particular um, cell is missing. If, um, no, excuse me, yes. If it is um, there, then L may or may not be freed. 
if it's if it's um, freed, that's given by that empty set notation, and we want to give back the error used after freed. If it's um, not freed, then we've got something looking like this, the top one. And is O in the block? If yes, the answer you you give back the um, value V and get success, or you get no and you still don't know anything at all because okay, it's not in the block, and you've got another thing to check if it's uh, whether the um, uh, bound is missing. Now let's assume the bound is missing. If the bound is missing, you haven't got the cell at L O, and we say it's a missing cell. But if the bound is there, in this case, it could be that the offset is above the bound. And if the offset is above the bound, you give the buffer overrun error. And if it's inside the bound, then it's a missing cell. So we have these um, different ways of getting results, which are either we've got the success case, or we have an error case, but it's an error case in a language sense. It's a sensible error that you want to, uh, to um, uh, report back to uh, um, the code developer. Or you have missing information, and that missing information could be down to you not putting enough annotations in to do with your reasoning. Or, um, you know, what, what, what is this reason for this um, missing information? It's much more ethereal and it's not really to do with code. And in fact, in the work on the spy abduction technique, this bit, this missing block and this missing cell, the name of the game is to be able to fix it automatically and keep on going. That's the idea. But that's not for today. So now I'll go to um, Gillian in practice. And um, we've, I'm very proud of this work. Um, and it's not my work, it's, it's um, the guy's work. And in particular, a lot to do with Petter. And it's the AWS encryption SDK. So basically, um, you don't have to encrypt and decrypt your code. You can go to the AWS cloud service and they will do it for you and they will automatically choose what is sensible given some criteria that you put in. So this has been around for a long time and is core to what um, AWS is doing. And we've been um, working with one of their developers just exploring the verification of um, a little bit of this module. And in particular, it's the um, deserialization module, quite frankly, because it was the easiest one. And we, you know, we're, this is not straightforward. This is verification. It's not automatic testing. So in particular, we work with, uh, we were exploring 200 lines of um, JavaScript code and 950 lines of C code. And in particular, this is a good test in the sense it's using lots of features. So it's not shirking the problem. And um, our current, so basically their current approach is they do lots and lots of testing and they've got runtime um, correctness assertions. So for example, they have this needs thing and this needs is really like a predicate and it's, um, yeah, I'm not sure. It, it's saying it's a, it's a first order formulae that basically says information about, um, in this case, reads pos must not be negative and it must be um, uh, constructed well with respect to byte length. So these are very tiny, simple things. These are things the code developer um, already wrote and was nothing to do with us. And um, our, uh, we set ourselves the task in C and in JavaScript to start off with first order and annotations that um, mimicked the, what the developer was doing, and then move to uh, um, uh, separation logic annotations that were specific to the JavaScript memory model or the C memory model, and hook them properly to the first order um, way of doing it, and see what happened, basically. That was our test. 
And just to say, we had some CBMC had actually been run on the C code, and there had been some work on bounded model checking given by the CBMC work. So this is actually the um, uh, the data structure that we were after. It's basically lots and lots of dynamic lists. That's a way to think about it. And I've said first you have a language independent first order abstractions and then language spe specific abstractions capturing the um, uh, the structure of the memory. We prove lemmas about all these abstractions and then the point is to specify and verify the functions associated with this module. And I'm going to tell you about this one just because this is where we found the bugs and it's a simple one to talk about. So the point is it's a section of variable length and it's quite complicated to specify and verify and it gave the bugs and in particular so we had to do a lot of work because we've done we've spent five years working on a fourth year um, course on separation logic for actually quite macho code developers who happen to like doing analysis and verification too and um, so we've done a lot of um, list algorithms but you know those standard list algorithms you don't do the dynamic lists so we had quite a lot of work to push to the dynamic list. And I absolutely love our exam question this year because we did a dynamic list as one of their questions. So we were quite pleased to do that. Um, yeah. Which they managed. Yeah, so if we were pleased. <laughs> so, um, just to give a little bit of summary of what we've done, because I know we're, uh, I, uh, my time is uh, uh, short. So we did two person months for JavaScript, one person month for C. Of course, this is totally approximate. It took longer than that, but we didn't work full time. And there's a huge number of annotations and there's too many. But we have to understand this and we have to understand this better. But in the context that I don't think, um, I don't think all hope is lost. So in particular, 1.2K um, annotations were language independent. And in particular, they were about the data structure that's been around for years. It's actually just changed slightly. And we should actually do the um, task of going back and see how difficult it is to make those the changes to the slightly different uh, message header. But actually, this has been a static thing for quite some time. And so inside Amazon, question mark, is it valuable for them to have these sorts of language independent specifications? Well, they're certainly exploring it. And then here, again, things are too much. But actually, this was in the context that we were doing it for the first time. And what does it mean to simplify and reassess and et cetera? We might never go there because what's the incentive to do that? You know, it's very hard hard as an academic project to push this further. We might do if we have an intern or something like that to, to, to who wants to explore. And we've we did an, just as an example, we've got a, a, a loop invariant. This was in the JavaScript um, function and we had four tactics to establish 27 invariant components. These invariants were an absolute nightmare, right? They, they're very difficult to read and what's just happened um, and uh, nine tactics to reestablish. So that's showing a little bit of um, the um, uh, complexity of what's going on. And here we've got some um, results. So we have verified it and um, We've, we've verified it and it gives the right behavior, which it does de uh, correctly deserialize the well-formed header and th throws the appropriate error if you've got incomplete or malformed information, which is the name of the game for this sort of header. We found two bugs in JavaScript implementation and three in the um, C implementation. And I'm very proud of the C ones because CBMC had already been done. And so there we were finding more, which we uh, like very much. 
we um, improved the implementation of one of the functions. So the developer had cut through the data structure. And if you're doing verification, you can't cut through the data structure, uh, you know. So, but he went, oh yeah, and changed it because he wants to match the data structure as the code developer, yeah. So uh, um, that was, I actually think there's a real argument to have a synergy going on between the um, code developers and the verifiers. The Cell 4 team is very, um, uh, were the first to say this very strongly. Um, and totally improved everything we were doing with Gillian. It was uh, for us a real learning curve because the first time we've gone to real world and um, we didn't expect the, the step to be quite so big and it was. It's the first time that uh, JavaScript code has been fully verified and the first time that one has the same abstractions on top of uh, for different languages such as JavaScript and C. But for example, French people have been doing a lot of what does it mean to work with these first order um, assertions as the uniform place to move in their case between um, different tools because they've got so many tools, uh, analysis tools in their world. So that's for slightly different reasons. So now just to conclude, it's Gillian uh, in future of what's happening. And and I think many of you probably uh, will know of the incorrectness separation logic work, which is absolutely to do with what does it mean to record bugs, excuse me, record specifications when you're doing bug finding and you don't know all information, you only know some information. And so that's the that was Pete O'Hearn's world. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago. We were actually doing almost the same in a slightly different place, which is exact information rather than incorrect, uh, the un under approximating information. So we've actually, uh, not unsurprisingly, given that we're um, uh, you know they're, they're wonderful colleagues just down the road for us. So we've um, got submitted something called exact separation logic that's rather interesting um, uh, boundary place between this world and this world. Uh, uh, so the main message of this world is if you want to verify list algorithms in a little library, use the exact separation logic world. If you want to do, um, uh, because you can, if you want to do um, uh, symbolic execution up to a certain number of paths, then you will use the incorrectness world. That's a way to think of it. And this is where Carolina came in. We would never have done this without her. She's been absolutely awesome. And um, Julian and Pat. So that's basically on the way um, and will hopefully come out sometime uh, this year. And then much more in the future, we're doing Gillian Rust. This is Sasha, it's his PhD student. Um, we're doing, um, uh, this one's very serious. Um, we're giving a talk, our Sasha is giving a talk at the Rust verification um, workshop happening in ETAPS. And we're in a very lovely position with Gillian. You've got Safe Rust. Safe Rust is, um, has a very nice structured memory model. And then Rust sometimes is unsafe and basically just think about it not so far off C memory. And so where that, that's all the grunge. Now in Gillian, we can do the grunge. Of course, we can do the uh, safe stuff. So now what's it mean to join it together and to work with unsafe Rust code? That's where we are um, at the moment. And uh, this will be a work in progress talk um, in this workshop. We've just got um, uh, Andres uh, Lerth uh, coming along from uh, Magnus My uh, Myrene's group, and he's doing Cox certified Gillian. But it looks as if we're, we're getting tested right at the heart of Call Gillian. So we'll probably end up doing some Call Gillian work first before spending all that effort on uh, Cox certified uh, Gillian. Why? Because, um, because there's an awful lot of complexity going on with this parametric nature of what's going on, and we think we can do better, that's why. 
I've put concurrency in red, and that's just to remind me to say, help, I need a, a Gillian concurrency person. If anybody's interested, I know somebody that might want to do it. Uh, we would uh, love somebody. We actually, I should have put, uh, we've got um, Daniela, who's, uh, uh, who has a photo at the beginning, and she's on concur uh, concurrency theory. So she will be able to do some of this. But we need that practitioner to be able to do it in the um, Gillian world. And this one, we're way off this, but uh, the whole point, you know, we should be able to do interoperability because we've got Gillian with the different memory models. So do we end up linking with the WASM work in future? Do we end up linking with some other um, uh, types of language interoperability? I just don't know. For this stage but it's for me it's too enticing not to think about i finished whilst we have questions i just want to run the javascript code that look we can do in 39 se seconds so it's nice to show you at least <laughs> so does anyone have any questions Thank you Thank very, you very much, much Luca. Uh, that was that very was interesting. interesting there's lots of information packed here uh let's see whether there are any questions from the audience Anyone wants to ask the first question? I could start with the first one and hopefully other people will follow. Uh, so you meant actually concurrency was uh, something I wanted to ask about. Um, how do you envisage um, compositionality being preserved when you have concurrency? Because I imagine those holes that you have are not very easy to, to maintain if you have concurrent stuff. So um, in, in the context of this tool, I have absolutely no idea. In the context of the theory, I'm, I've got another stream of work, which is on um, concurrent separation logics. And I know exactly, well, exactly is too strong, but I know a lot about that in terms of uh, you have pockets of shared memory and what does it mean to uh, work with that shared memory, you work up to an invariant. And I was part of a stream of work where um, the current work is the IRIS project work that's built on um, some things that I've done. So, um, and something that we've done very recently is um, work with liveness um, conditions on top of that. So I know about how to do logical abstraction. I know how to do um, logical atomicity to get to this atomic nature, even though it's fine grained underneath the hood, it's not um, at atomic. I know how to do um, uh, environment liveness properties now. But all this is at the level of theory. Meanwhile, we've got the Facebook guys doing tiny little things at um, the level of how to be useful to Facebook right now. And then where, where does one bridge? That's what I would like for uh, my project. I know, I know the current state practice, the, the way too complicated state theory, it's a place theory, and where should we be in that space? Totally no idea. The whole point about um, Gillian is, for me, it's a laboratory in which to play. So in particular, um, I can even work with a language with basic actions for the memory model, sequential composition and function composition. I don't need to do anything to do with GoTo. I don't need to do anything with um, control flow because that's all sort of orthogonal to the main issues of what's it mean to do the analysis. So just with these very tiny language, I can start exploring concurrency to then, of course, I want to end up um, with analysing concurrent rust. But, you know, we'll start small. Haven't got a sequential rust yet. Are there any other questions? So, uh, uh, how about aliasing and pointers? Is that something that is already supported in the current framework? Yes, that's, that's sort of the point. All that's done. Good. Are there other, other questions? From and there? absolutely, this thing to do with pointers, this is absolutely the point. So um, you've got pointers, and then with Rust, the pointers get fatter, and so we go on. Yeah, so it, this is absolutely. Very interesting. Other questions? 
any other questions before we close the talk? I don't see any other questions in the chat box. No one is raising their hands. So can I ask, can I, can I sort of uh, flip it round and ask you guys questions? So uh, I know you well, but at the same time, I don't know uh, so much about uh, the, uh, the verified viability series and the um, trustworthy uh, autonomous vehicles. We should know absolutely much more than we should uh, than, I, than I do at the moment. So in particular, given what you've heard, what can you say back to me and go, oi, what should I be looking at? How should I be? We only, we don't live so far away. So actually, in some sense, we should just go and meet. But That's right. So, so uh, let me think. So let me give a broad introduction to the project. And then I will uh, try to think out loud about possibility, collaboration possibilities. So the project is, is very broad. It's uh, seven universities, something like uh, we, we just had an all hands meeting uh, in Nottingham. We were about, I think, 12 people in person, five or six people. And you're actually there. Lovely. Yeah, it, it was really great uh, to we met for the first time. Uh, I mean, many, many of the people uh, I had collaborated with for two years without having met them. So that was very good. Um, it's the, the, the vision of the project is to build a unifying semantic framework for connecting many different aspects of autonomous systems, starting from, uh, say, a physical design of an autonomous system. So we have roboticists who actually build systems. We have someone who uh, has a drone um, uh, for firefighting. Um, uh, from the University of Leeds, they, they, they do the actual uh, uh, physical system design, uh, all the way to the sub-symbolic AI, symbolic AI, uh, interaction between physics and, 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 um, and computation, uh, and the human uh, system, uh, human compu computer interaction aspects. So this is very broad, and the vision is that we build a unifying semantic framework that can connect these and, and um, provide uh, semantic preserving translations between these different um, in different domains. So what we have been doing in the first year of the project so far is to look at different abstractions that are needed for, for the different aspects and how they could be represented in that uh, common semantic framework, uh, including things like uncertainty, epistemic uncertainty, aleatory uncertainty, um, and um, and how, for example, we could look at um, uh, human behavior, uh, how we could look at physical design and their interactions and stuff like that. Uh, in terms of verification techniques, it's also very broad. We have theorem proving, we have uh, model checking, we have testing. And the idea is that we will use the, the appropriate verification technique for depending on the complexity of the aspects we are dealing with. So there are absolutely um, uh, possible collaboration points there. Uh, we have people who are doing that semantic framework, for example, in Isabel uh, at the moment. Um, I don't know whether any of them are present today at the meeting. I guess not, but uh, uh, they, they have been working on this for uh, almost a year by now. Um, we haven't got yet to the actual verification, so I guess once we start with the actual verification, we could use a lot of the technology you have presented today and uh, of course what you're doing is a bit lower level in the sense of being very close to actual implementation we are more looking at the design um, yeah uh, but I, 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 I do think there is definitely the possibility of bridging that gap and looking at least at some components of the implementation and and actually that was a question that came up during the all hands meeting we have high level designs in terms of state machines uh, which look a bit like uml state machines but formalized properly um, and we have code actual code being generated um, from them and and this gap uh, filling that gap i think is, is a possible collaboration point and and so, excuse me so you generate that code but you but you don't have the uh, how how trustworthy is that generation Exactly. So that, that was the question that was asked during the all hands meeting. Uh, I guess e even if we have uh, a proof of correctness, which is not yet there as far as I know, uh, there will definitely be tweaks in the code once once you deploy it, right? So so uh, that that kind of reality gap, we call it, is something that could be filled in using the technology you're, you, you are providing there. So mm -hmm. 
I think that is a possible collaboration point, and uh, we could definitely look into that and define something. Uh, and in particular, so, so for us, so we're we're starting at the code and building the abstractions up, and so then there's the where do we be so that you guys can come down if you see yeah, them. Exactly. Exactly. So we we have two main case studies that we have been developing. One is a robot, uh, an assistive dressing robot that, that helps people kind of uh, wear a garment. And the other one is a firefighting drone. And I and I think we can definitely use that case, that one of these two case studies to, to uh, look at this uh, reality gap between the actual implementation of the robot and, and the design that we are developing at the moment. So yeah, I, I definitely see collaboration points there. Right. So uh, we should come and say hello to each other at some point. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, l let's plan something. And then I think we can kind of um, have a more focused group, of a few people from our side, a few people from your side, and then look at a, a concrete case study to, to see how when much it of it makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, thank you very much, Philippa, for, for this wonderful talk. And then definitely we'll plan something to, 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 to work together.